And now, the survival show that once survived watching old people eat oatmeal. In this episode, we sit down with Jill from Remnant K9360. She and I discuss getting your dog ready to be an asset in a survival situation. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 236. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe? And sound. Jill, welcome to In the Rabbit Hole. Oh, thank you, Aaron. Good to be here. I'm personally a huge animal lover. Um, always have been, especially when it comes to horses and dogs. They they top my list of domesticated animals that I like. And longtime listeners of the show also know that I'm on the second tactical Weimariner 2.0 slash studio dog slash VP of shenanigans. <laughs> so doing a, a show specifically on selecting and training a dog uh, to be both a, a well-behaved companion and an asset in a survival situation really excites me. It's, it's been something I've wanted to do for a long time, and it's been hard to really find somebody that rides both, both sides of that fence. You can, you can find lots of preppers, you can find lots of dog people, but it's, it's hard to find somebody that does both. So this is going to be great. And of course, fortunately, audience, we, we have Jill Powell from Remnant Canine 360 is here to speak with us on this topic. So, Jill, let's start from the beginning. How did you get into working with animals? Aaron, it's funny you mentioned that your top of your list is horses and dogs. Mm-hmm. In high school, I showed horses. Oh, okay. Um, so I've always been a strong proponent or, or lover of animals. Grew, always grew up with dogs, cats, and horses uh, around. So it's always just kind of been a part of my lifestyle. But until uh, recently, as you get older, your interests change and life happens and you have children and different things occur. But just um, probably about two, two and a half years ago, we got a Texas healer, which is a blue healer and border collie Mm -hmm, mix mm -hmm. uh, rescue. And this dog needed a job. So (laughs) I was like, okay, I've got to figure out something to do with her. So I started doing research. And apparently, when you have shown horses, because I did hunter jumpers, you tend to be drawn to uh, what's called agility in the dog world. So I decided I was going to try agility uh, with our Texas healer. Her name's Haley. And so we've been competing um, now for about a year and a half, but I'm also a very preparedness minded person, a prepper. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I use my love for animals and my preparedness mindset and kind of, like you said, clash those two worlds together. And so that's when my husband and I uh, really started to sit down and say, hmm, you know, we've got dogs. They can either be probably a liability in those types of situations, or we could turn them into assets and really um, hone in on what they do well. And uh, so that's kind of where it all started. Um, And we also started talking with a trainer that was uh, ex-military canine trainer. And he had that kind of same mindset. He was like, yeah, you know, you can, you can do this uh, with kind of blending these two worlds. So he was really willing to um, kind of explore the options with us. So it's been, I guess, a journey that's taken quite a while, you know, from growing up, doing things uh, for fun, just recently doing things for fun, you know, the agility and the competition type stuff, bringing home ribbons then to really shifting into all those things are great, but in these survival situations, how could we make our household pet or canine a really a part of that team and make them kind of another tool um, in Mm -hmm. your, in your toolbox per se. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. And even giving them the training to not become a hindrance in those situations. There's so many different instances I've been in, in my life where there's been a dog present too. And it's, you know, I'm having to deal with the dog in the situation and the two are clashing and it's just not good. Right. Yeah, this makes perfect sense. To back up a little bit, how how did preparedness get into your life? 
I married a prepper. Oh, well, that is do it. how that happened. Um, my husband and I have been uh, married for six years. Um, now, this past October was our sixth year anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, but he was into um, this preparedness mindset, this prepper mindset, long before I kind of showed up on the scene. This is our second marriage, mm-hmm. um, both of us. So my husband is really the one that that got me into that into that world. Oh, very cool. Okay. So getting into the dogs, and I guess starting from the top, you break things into two major categories that, that I could really kind of discern, which one was scent detection and the other one was patrol. Can you explain those divisions a little bit? And are there more divisions? Am I missing something? We specifically chose those two um, skills in a survival situation because the you see that, again, we're not saying that we're going to turn out a military or a police caliber dog, but mm-hmm. that's mostly what those working dogs do. Okay. And they're very beneficial in situations to try to help keep people safe. So, for example, we have three dogs and we have a German Shepherd that we have currently training her in scent detection and patrol. Now, nose work in the dog field right now is huge. I mean, people at least here in the Texas area are going crazy for like nose work competitions, Mm. which is awesome. You can get ribbons and have a great time with your dog. But we were more thinking of how you could use them in a survival situation. So we gears towards explosives, Mm, which obviously there's some risk. But again, this is this is in a grid down survival situation where you're trying to maybe move your family from one location to another, whether you have access to a vehicle or you're having to walk. People may not play nice on your journey from point A to point B. Right. So if you feel that you've come into some unfriendly territory How could your dog help you stay safe? So our scent detection package gives you the basics on how to train a dog in any scent. And that's really important when you're training um, a dog in scent detection. You really need to set goals on why you're doing it. For example, our dog, Halo, we have imprinted her on um, explosives. We can now not change our mind and say, hey, I want to imprint her on narcotics. I'd rather find drugs instead. Interesting. Be- okay. Because all that's going to happen is the dog is going to alert on the scent that you've trained them on. You can train them up to 14, 15 cents. Hmm. I mean, it, they're amazing. So when they alert on an odor and say you've, you've trained them or imprinted them on an explosive and a drug, you're not going to know, okay, should I run, you know, get my family away from here? Or do I need to confiscate whatever that is? And I don't know, maybe stay a while and have a party. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's really important with scent detection that you, and if you want to do competition, that's great. They do birch and ANSED and clove in the American uh, Kennel Club, hmm. AKC competition. Um, they use those type of scents. As a family or an individual, you really kind of need to figure out what your what your goal is. You know, mm. what's the the purpose? So that's the scent detection. And then the patrol is protection. But I think what's more important, that tr- that type of training, at least from our perspective, is giving you another asset to maybe even defuse a situation. Um, I'm pro gun. Um, I know how to shoot a gun, but I hope that I never have to use it on another human being. Right. And I think even people that say, hey, I don't have any problems, you know, in a in a really this survival situation, I'm just going to gun them down. That's going to change you. It's going to it's going to change, I think, your psyche. Mm -hmm. And so the dog could be deterrent enough and stand their ground. And yes, you may have to confiscate, you know, take that person down through a the dog bite or or whatever. But hopefully that dog is going to provide some other opportunities to deal with a survival situation um, so that it doesn't have to escalate to the more um, violent options. I got you. Okay. That makes sense. So 
patrol is more the the defensive stuff that you teach a dog. Right. Is that? Okay. So it's bite it's a bite work on and off leash, and we also offer where they can clear a building. So they would help you. Well, and you can also clear a building through scent detection, really, too, mm. depending on what you think is there. They provide that asset as well. Oh, OK. That's really cool. So what about breeds? And I guess and this is one of the things that we were talking about a little bit before we started recording. And, and also you've kind of brought up here as far as like, like you're not really trying to make a, a military caliber dog. You're, you're really trying to take your household pet, your best friend, and turn them into an asset, not, you know, not a bleeding edge of a weapon kind of thing. So with that in mind, I guess, what breeds really do fit the prepper lifestyle and and this sort of training the best? Well, with scent detection, really any dog that's willing to do the work for you, we recommend. Most people in the scent world, they kind of stay away from the flat-based dogs. But other than that, any dog that's willing to work for you. So for example, our, our scent detection trainer, he has trained chihuahuas to do scent work. And he said some of those chihuahuas are better scent dogs than the dogs that you think of, like German Shepherds and Dutch Shepherds and Belgian Malinois. Uh, he said he's had great success with some of the smaller breeds as well because they can get into smaller spaces. Um, so with scent detection, you know, the sky's the limit if that dog's willing to to work with you and, and do the work that you're asking them to do. Now, with patrol, um, obviously, you're going to need a little bigger dog. We recommend at least 45 pounds or greater for obvious reasons. Smaller dogs are not going to be as intimidating. <laughs> yeah. You know, they'll be more like your car alarm. So need a larger dog. Um, we recommend from the working or herding group of dogs. There's lots of dogs to choose from in those groups. But off the top of my head, of you know, German Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds, um, Belgian Malinois, cattle dogs, you know, your Australian cattle dogs or Australian uh, Shepherds. Hmm. The one, two patrol dogs that we don't really recommend are uh, Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, and then Labs, because they are so friendly. Like they love everybody. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, patrol dogs have to be tentative, a little bit tentative, you know, and not everybody's their friend. So mm. those are really the only two breeds that we say, oh, you probably don't want to try with them. But other than that, you've still got lots of other options. Too funny. You know, and that's really interesting about the small dogs, because I was curious if they could be useful or if they're just kind of written off as zombie bait. But that's really interesting. So speaking of writing up, did you just write off Wyman runners? they lost ADD of stubbornness cause or? <laughs> no, I think you've got to give every dog a chance. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Daisy will keep you around a little bit longer. So there you go. Well, because I, well, we, I've talked about Haley, who's our Texas healer. I've also talked about Halo. Mm. We have a third dog. Her name's Holly. I love her to death, but I call her our one trick dog because I'll train her to do something. I think we have it like beautifully mastered. And then I don't know, it could be an hour later. I'll try to go back and get her to do the same thing. And it's like, we've never even had that conversation. <laughs> so you just got to love them. Yeah. Like, you know, and you, you work to the, just like people, you're going to want to work to their strengths. Um, yeah. So okay. to do that, you're going to have to spend uh, time with your dog and kind of figure them out is a lot about spending time with your dog and figuring out who they are and what kind of makes them tick. So, see, that's an interesting thing. So let's dive into that for a second. What, how do you just at a high level overview, how do you spend time with and just get to know? And I guess it's, it's really about setting expectations for you and the dog about what their capabilities are. Right. I'm um, just discovering like, are they very, are they food driven? Do they really like food? Are they going to work, you know, really hard if you have little chunks of steak? Um, or are they really toy driven? Do they love that you, you know, throw a ball in the backyard or tug with them? Do they like to just be personally like touched? Um, that's actually a form of play hmm. where you're doing personal play with the dog. I'm currently actually taking another online course to learn how to play with my dogs. Hmm. Didn't even know there was such a thing until uh, our trainer, our obedience trainer said, hey, you know, you can be a little better at playing with your dogs. And I'm like, really? 
I go, I didn't even know there was like a thing. And she was like, oh yeah. And I've learned so much because I do do some performance stuff with our dogs as well. And so I've learned how to play with my dogs better, which actually affects their performance Mm -hmm. and how their, their motivation to work uh, for me. So it's really, it's actually really fascinating. Dogs, I think are just amazing creatures and obviously very loyal. So when you're spending time discovering who they are in these kind of normal, non-stressful times, when these survival situations come up, the loyalty, I mean, to me, is probably going to be pretty unmatched just because you have built that relationship with them. Yeah, definitely. At what age do you typically recommend people start training with a dog? Oh, as soon as you bring them home. Okay. If you've acquired a puppy, you usually get the puppy around, you know, six to eight weeks. Mm. As soon as you bring them home, you can start working with them. You can start uh, working those basic commands, um, you know, putting them on a leash, uh, doing those types of things. So with a puppy, as soon as you bring them home, you start working with them. And if you're going to do patrol, you can even do drive and bite work with a six to eight week old puppy just by playing tug Mm. um, and really building that drive for them to tug and play with you. You know, if that, if that's an interest uh, for you now for obviously older dogs, maybe you brought home a rescue or a dog from a shelter. then I always recommend that you do some type of training with them. Um, You know, especially pride. I would recommend the obedience obviously, but uh you know, I don't think a dog's ever too old to learn something new. Mm-hmm. Now, with scent, with scent detection, though, your formal training won't start till the puppy is about six months old. Okay. And with patrol, that formal training won't happen until they're 15 to 18 months old. Oh, wow. So, okay. yeah, they need to be a little bit more mature. You can play with them and play with the and get the drive, the bite and drive built up in them. But you're really not going to start doing this bite on and off uh, leash kind of work and getting them to stand off a bite um, and some of these more formal kind of commands with patrol until they're uh, much older. So with that said, also with scent and patrol, you're going to they're going to probably need to be retired, I guess is the best word, not do the work anymore when they're about eight or nine years old. Like just like okay. us, yeah. bodies wear out, you know, their, their sniffers not going to work quite as well as it used to, you know, as the dog gets older, doing that bite work can be very well strenuous on the decoy, the person getting bite bit. Um, but also, you know, the dogs kind of getting thrown around too, uh, when you're doing that type of training. So if you're really into this and want the longest life out of your dog for doing the work, you know, we recommend getting a puppy and then you've got, you know, nine years mm. uh, to, to kind of have them do that work for you. And we also recommend you, you know, talk to your vet and the health of your pet. There's all, you know, there's things that go into it as well. Right, we can't right. just say, oh, at nine, that's it. It may have to be sooner if there's been an injury or something like that. So yeah. we always recommend that you're in conversation with your vet as well. That makes sense. I mean, every dog, kind of like people every dog's an individual and every breed is certainly uh different from the next breed too so that makes right. perfect sense we'll be back after this quick break listener do you get at least three dollars a month worth of value out of itrh you should see what we do for the roving horde armada members check it out today by visiting itrh.net members get access to episodes a day early access to monthly virtual and in-person meetups in some areas, an invitation to the secret ITRH Armada Facebook group so you can chat about survival all day long with like-minded people, access to every episode ever produced by ITRH. That's right, all the way back to the beginning, including one that was never aired. And those are just a few things you get with your membership when you sign up and become part of the ITRH Roving Horde by going to ITRH. Dot net. Again, that's itrh.net. Let's say you started at Scent and Patrol and stuff. How how long does it usually take for the average dog? Because, uh, of course, you know, going back to what we just said, um, <laughs> every dog is an individual. But how long does it take before they're actually useful to you as a partner? 
Right. I would recommend that you're going to start with the obedience. And now some dogs may already have some obedience training. So obviously you can take, you know, some of those weeks off. Um, with our package online, at least, we've not only done basic commands that are important, I think, for every dog, but we've also offered some more advanced commands that then set you up for success for scent and or patrol, such as going out and doing work away from you. Directional, so you're sending your dog out and telling them to go to the left or to the right. Um, release, obviously, to release um, the bite. Um, calling them off, telling them to not bite someone. So there's some more advanced commands um, in that. And so that takes about 12 to 14 weeks. Again, depending on your training schedule, we recommend three times a week, 15 to 20 minutes per session. You want to keep them short. You want to keep them positive. You and the dog want to stay engaged. So that's about an hour a week. So okay. that's like one TV show, yeah. right? Get up off the couch, turn the TV off. I don't know. Step away from your phone. If you, you know, <laughs> like a phone junkie and, um, then go s- spend some time, you know, 20 minutes, three times a week. That's kind of what we recommend for that. So that's our 360 boot camp. That's obedient. Now for scent detection, it's going to probably take about four, four months. Again, depending on the age of the dog too. So if you get a puppy, you know, you've got six months where you're just kind of doing your obedience thing and getting to know them. And then at six months, six to eight months, you're going to be able to start that formal training. And then it's going to take about four, four months to get through that. Again, depending on your training schedule and how consistent you are. And then with patrol, that takes a little bit longer. Um, Again, depending on the age of the dog as well, but between four to six months for that type of training. And then you're always going to want to refine your skills. I mean, Let's say it takes you a full, what's that, like a year, year and a half Mm. to get through all of these skills. But you're always going to want to revisit those skills. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I've I've got that one mastered. And so three years from now, if I'm in a situation, the dog's going to respond to me. So you always kind of have to go back and and refine and, and train and practice just like we do with other skills that we've learned, you know, whether we sew or garden or learn alternative forms of communication or, you know, how to harvest a rabbit or, you know, whatever your, your kind of survival skills are doing Mm. first aid, you know, you're going to practice that first aid. You're not going to just learn it and then put it on the shelf and say, Oh, you know, I hope I can remember it when, when it really counts. So. That's really interesting about how much time in a week it takes. Cause I was really thinking like, wow, okay. You know, this is this is one of the things I was getting ready to start working with with Daisy, um, as far as just some basic obedience stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be hours every week, and trying to figure out where am I going to fit that in. But that's interesting because you're you're talking about it's really not that much. So, in re- well, with obedience, I mean, you could do obedience with her her kibble for dinner at night because she's going to be really hungry. Mm-hmm. Boy, dogs like to work when they're hungry. Oh yeah, especially if you're giving them you know their kibble or their their treats. So, I mean, you could work five minutes on right before she has her dinner, you get her to sit, you get her to lay down, you get her to wait on the food and, you know, you put the the bowl of food down and you tell her she has to stay and wait. And then you give her your release word and you tell her, okay, and then she gets to eat. So you can even incorporate some of the, at least the basic obedience into your everyday like routine Mm -hmm. um, in life uh, so that you're not even really, I would say, setting a specific time aside to train. It's more kind of you're just working that into your schedule. Okay. So with the more advanced skills, is that where you start having to really work it into the schedule and be diligent about right the dog? Right. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, with scent detection, you're um, you're obviously having them look and search for something. Um, and when you first imprint a dog on a scent, you're either working out of shoe boxes or coffee cans or a like a plywood box but you're going to have these three three similar looking containers lined up against the wall and you're going to have two boxes that don't have any odor in them and then you're going to have one box that's your source box that has the odor inside and that's that's your beginning stage of how you imprint them on alerting on odor 
So that is actually, you know, a specific process, a a specific training process that you have to go through to get um, that to happen. And then with patrol, obviously, you're not going to drag, you know, a bite bite pillow or a puppy pillow around the house. You're going (laughs) to have to intentionally go outside and do some of that work. Mm -hmm. So. That makes sense. Is there is there a point at which it becomes just too much for the dog or is that like in general or is that something where the dog will just let you know, like, hey, I'm done with this for the day? Yeah, you're going to you're going to probably figure out that that they're done. And that's why we really recommend just 15 to 20 minutes. One, it, it keeps you both focused and engaged. And, and two, then you're not running the risk of getting worn out. And then you're you're always going to want to really end on a positive note. You're not going to want to train so much that both of you are like, oh, my gosh, that really kind of sucked. You know, like we we uh, that wasn't really fun for Mm. either one of us. You're really going to want to be intentional about staying positive and ending on, I would say, like a high note um, each time that that you leave the training. Okay, All right. That makes sense. Because dogs are great on picking up, you know, your emotions Mm -hmm. and. Um, your feelings, your anxiety, your frustration, they're they're really amazing in picking those types of, you know, feelings up. So uh, to stay positive, because obviously our, our training methods are based on positive reinforcement and, and uh, getting the, the dog to work for you through those positive experiences. I gotcha. Where would you say people most often go wrong with with their dog training, be it obedience or or even these more advanced, more serious things? Is there a commonality that just people just you're like, oh, people just get this wrong consistently? <laughs> For me personally, I'm too hard on myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I'm hard on myself, I tend to close down or shut down and my dogs pick up on that. So maybe just trying to move through a skill too quickly. Okay. Uh, people just being to where, impatient. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, I got them to sit a couple of times. They must have it. But you had them sit in your living room, which is very familiar to them and low distraction. But are they going to sit with you when you take them outside? Mm. Mm. Are they going to sit with you when you take them to a park? Are they going to sit with you when you take them, you know, to the lake? Mm. Or so you you have to increasingly heighten the distraction for them because they don't generalize. So you're going to have, we, we recommend that you start all of this training in a very low, non distracting or distractive environment. And then over time, you're going to want to add more and more distraction, which is going to be super important in these survival situations, because there's going to probably be a lot of distraction, especially if you're having to call on them to do some of this work. So I would probably say that would, that would be one of them Okay, is make sure you you're working with them in a lot of different situations. And again, you're going to pick up if, if it's too much, if you've taken them from no distraction to too high of distraction, they'll definitely let you know. Mm. And then you'll just need to take them back to a less distracting environment and you know, conquer that skill there and then try that more distracting environment in the future. So going on to what y'all have done, y'all have, y'all have built what looks like a very comprehensive online training system. And to me, that's very cool because I love the idea of not having to go somewhere. But I guess for a lot of people, and even myself, like I'd worry like, oh, I'm doing something wrong or that, you know, it's, it's, It's different. Like, I think we're not used to, most people aren't used to doing everything virtually. You know, there's a lot of things we're like, oh, that makes sense. And then even though it's like not that big of a difference in a lot of instances, it doesn't feel the same way for other things. Um, You know, I mean, I think like 10 years ago, buying shoes online, that would have been crazy. And now it's like, who goes to the store to buy shoes? But so how does online training different from doing it in person? Well, I think you've touched on some of them. Obviously, online training is available to you 24-7. So you can train your dog on your schedule. You don't have to, you know, get in the car, pack up all your gear, go to a facility, which, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes away. So you've got that travel time. So it's very convenient. And you're able to do the training where you're going to call on your dog to do the work. 
So you will be working, you know, say you're wanting to do this work in your home or you're going to want to do it at your bug out location, or maybe you have, you know, a primary or an alternate route and you're going to want to do some work there. So I think those are some of the benefits of online training because you do have that access. And also on online training, you can also watch the videos over and over and over again. So Mm -hmm. if you're really struggling with one skill, you can go watch that video, you know, three or four times if you need to, or you can stop it and start it and go, you know, go back. But I do, I do agree with you that you said, I'm worried I might be doing something wrong. Um, So we do offer and our trainers are available to answer questions. And we actually encourage you to submit videos if you're, if you're having difficulty with something, because there are going to be challenges. Mm -hmm. Again, you're working with an individual doll. So if you're running up against something that's frustrating you, or you're just not really getting it, we really encourage you to send us a video of you doing the training, and then we can give you feedback. Uh, Because you know, an army of one and you're trying to train this dog and you're like, this isn't working, you know, and the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, right. expecting a different result. Uh-huh. We don't want you to get stuck in that. And so our trainers would be able to help you pinpoint or maybe just even talking through, hey, when I do this, you know, Halo is just shutting down. So how can I make this better for her? And we can even Skype, uh, you know, with you and have the the uh, video set up so we can see you do it in real time as well. Oh, very cool. So now y- we were talking a little bit before the show and, and we've mentioned obedience several times. I thought it was interesting that you find that a lot of people have obedience questions or they have concerns about, you know, dogs in a survival situation in general, but like, you had some in- really interesting things to say about it. Can you kind of share with us, like taking that dog at the very beginning from just lovable, goofy buddy to, you know, an actual working companion. Right. Yeah. Um, we went to a prepper camp actually this past uh, September and I was really surprised uh, by the people that came to my class and I was interacting with them. I really thought like scent detection and patrol would be, Oh, we're going to get all these questions. And a lot of it was just basic obedience and the obedience piece, especially in a survival um, situation. So we've kind of really identified our trainer. I went back and I said, hey, you know, what are like the top three commands that you would want to have your dog master to help, you know, survive? She feels that the three most important ones are that they stay with you either in a sit or down position. So in that high stress situation, they stay with you. You're not going to lose them. Mm hmm. Um, that they have a very strong recall. So if for some reason they were, you know, they went away from you, um, that you would be able to call them back and they would come back to you um, in those high stress situations as well. And then this isn't really a command and it goes back to the other two, but getting your dog to stay engaged and focused on you. Mm. How can you get your dog to just all, no matter what's going on around you, to be just focused on what you're asking them uh, to do. And then that goes, that goes back to that discovering kind of what makes them tick, you know, what's, are they food driven? Are they toy driven? You know, will a a stroke down their back, help them to calm down um, those kind of things. And then the other thing too, kind of the flip side of this is a lot of people are like, you don't want to have a dog in a survival situation, because what if you're trying to conceal your position and the dog barks, you actually can train your dog to be quiet. Mm. And Holly, the dog that I mentioned earlier, our one trick dog, she will bark (laughs) at her shadow. She like, and she has different barks. Like she has, I am very angry at you bark. Oh, I'm very happy. Oh, there's a stranger. Now I'm just going to howl at you because I can. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So she has like all these different barks, but um, I'm currently working with her on a quiet command. So if we're trying to conceal our position, maybe people, you know, there's a band of people or a group of people that are passing by. We don't want to engage with them. They're not paying us any mind. We're, you know, we're not paying them any mind. But if our dog barks, that may intrigue them. Oh, I wonder if they've got some stuff, Yeah, you know, or yeah, yeah. what's going on over there or, 
or whatever may go through their mind. And then now we're having to engage with them. So you can train your dog to even like be quiet. You can train them to bark on command. You can train them to be quiet. See, that's really cool. And I think to me, that's some of the most interesting stuff or the most basic things, things like that, that typically get overlooked when we start trying to think of how do I train my dog for the zombie apocalypse? And and you miss the little things like, well, maybe being quiet, teaching your dog to be quiet at the right time would be a good idea. Well, awesome stuff. So Jill, somebody's listening to this episode and they're like, wow, this, this sounds really interesting. It sounds really convenient. How do they find you and how do they like start this process with you? Our website is uh, Remnant Canine 360. Again, spell that canine out, C-A-N-I-N-E 360.com. And then on once you get on our website and on that page, depending on what you're interested in, we have the 360 boot camp, which is our obedience. We have scent detection. We have patrol. But you can learn more. And once you hit the learn more button, you're obviously going to be taken to a screen where you're going to see what we offer in the way of commands and what you'll be learning. And then you can also sign up with your name and your email address and get access to our free video lessons. Um, And that free video lesson is really where we talk about you kind of discovering your dog, what makes them tick, um, what type of training we adhere to, the positive reinforcement type training Mm -hmm. and different ways like training techniques. Are you going to lure the dog into this behavior? Are you going to shape the dog into this behavior? Or are you going to catch them doing the behavior and then reward them? So those are all kind of training terms Hmm. that you'll learn in that video. And you also get to kind of see the quality of video that we're that we're producing. And then if you're, you know, still interested after that, you just decide which package you want to purchase and you're able to purchase that package. And then you start working through the curriculum. And we're like I said, we're available. I will be the one to pick up the phone and talk with you and get you, you know, the, the help and and point you in the right direction. Oh, very cool. Really neat stuff. Well, Jill, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this information with us today. It's, it's really neat stuff. And hopefully we'll have you on again at some point in the the near future to talk more about dogs. Can you give us your website address one more time, please? Sure. It's remnant k9360.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Show notes, links to learn more about preparing your dog for good times and bad and other resources from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash E two thirty six support the show and get ITRH roving horde armada members only benefits like what you ask like twice monthly virtual hangs access to the secret ITRH armada Facebook group and the on demand bug out bag class. And that's just to name a few things. Go to iturh.net. Now, twice a month, members get on a private, secure video chat to talk about guns, mead, food storage, more guns, guns again, or whatever's on your mind. Again, go to iturh.net to read more. That's iturh.net to find out about exclusive members-only benefits. With that, we wrap up episode number 236. From the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. <laughs>